Right, <clears throat> thank you. Well, welcome to the Anatomy of Java Vulnerabilities. Be careful how I say that. Um, this is your last chance, because it's all going to be secret. You can't say anything, so we'll lock you in for the rest of the day. Uh, okay. Um, so my name is Steve Paul. I work for IBM. Um, I do lots of things. One of the things I do is developer advocacy, so I come out and talk about stuff. Um, I've been doing Java for a very long time, since, well, since before it was one. Um, and I work in open source and things like that. But mostly this is because it's a Java advocacy, a Java vulnerabilities talk. It doesn't really matter whether it's IBM or Oracle or whatever. Um, it's about vulnerabilities. So I'm going to take you through what in the UK would call a sheep per dip. I'm going to talk to you about, I'm going to show you as much code as I can, but I'm also going to talk about uh, some of the realities, the processes and things like that. And we're going to try and do that in 45 minutes. So if I get sidetracked, we might pace through some slides. Um, so bear with me. So let's start with what's important. Some code, or in fact a diff. It's a one-line diff. Okay, it's in floating decimal. Stuff happens. It's had a plus one added. All right, you might go hmm. Huh? So, okay, it fixes a bug. Oh, you can't see the red, can you? Excellent. Um, so that's going to be fun, right? So it fixes a bug. That was a Real diff, and it fixes a bug in pars double. Um, <laughs> and there's an obscure number which you can't see because I've obscured it. Um, right, plus, I wonder, not even read it out. 20, 2001, this was found. Somebody found that if you gave Java a string with that number in and it parsed it, it went in for an infinite loop and it sucked your CPU and it just went and went and went. And this was reported in 2001 and just sat around. Nobody thought much about it. Well, however, it's not really um, that sort of irrelevant. Okay. What, people, what happened was uh, this got found again and it gets, used as, it gets used as an attack vector. Because if you've got code that takes a double in and you know it's a string and you haven't got this thing fixed then as it gets parsed by your java code that thread locks because it goes into a tight spin right and basically everybody was affected you probably heard about this uh, everything goes into a, a tight spin and it's it's trivial because all you got to do is have uh, I know content type or even some JSON, whatever, it gets passed to your application uh, from the web server and as soon as the Java code kicks in, it spins, right? So there we are, a really, really simple denial of service thing, right? It cost the industry enormous amounts of money. The reason it was so painful was because it was so easy to exploit and we had, we had kids going, oh, I've got to do is just go to your website um, and put this number in the header in the right place and your website comes down. And, you know, that happened a lot. And people just did it for fun, right? One character, or well, two, right? And a lot of what I'm going to show you is all about this horror story that's, that's, that's in our code, right? And how, what you, you might consider Java vulnerabilities, you hear about them in the press and you go, that's a big thing. But actually vulnerabilities aren't big things. Vulnerabilities are little things. It's how they're put together and how they're exploited. Okay. So let's go through what a vulnerability is. So first thing you can look at, sorry, I'm gonna have to read this out. So it says a vulnerability is a bug which can be exploited by an attacker. It was a bug it had unexpected behavior, somebody exploited it, right? But there are all sorts of exploits, right? So there's uh, denial of service where you just make your system crash. There are ones that, that drive, you, drive you to use loads of memory, ones that make you do a lot of networking, basically denying your service, right? 
There are exploits that reduce your integrity. They get in and change your data. They steal your data. They run arbitrary code execution, and I'll show you one of those in a minute. Uh, there are vulnerabilities that let you elevate, elevate your privilege. You've got some code running that you think is secure because it's running under some minimal uh, user ID, and there's a vulnerability that makes it means that they can run it under root. Right? These are all. This is what you would call an exploit, and those exploits are created by exploiting vulnerabilities. So you may not care, right? Why should you care about this? So maybe once upon a time it was an academic. Maybe there was no, no bad guys out there. But right now, that's not true. Last year, I, it was Java 1, I talked about cybercrime. Did anybody come to that talk last year? Anybody here? Yeah, cool, okay. So you'll see one or two of the slides, but not much. The point is that our perception of the bad guys has always been incorrect. We've always had this thought that there's some guy in a bedroom, a young 18-year-old, a 16-year-old, he's just hacking, right? But it's not like that anymore at all. Right now, cybercrime is the biggest growing criminal activity in the world, right? Um, and, sorry, you can't see the slide. So I'm gonna read them out. Um, in 2016, cybercrime was estimated to be worth $445 billion. That was for last year. This year, that number will gone up, would have gone up 20%. All right. In 2013, the whole of the illicit drugs trade was only valued at $435 billion. All right. So the cybercrime industry is taking off. The criminals make more money out of that than they do out of drugs. All right. It has least risk for them. It's growing the fastest. It's going to be, they reckon by the end of 2019, it could be $2,100 billion. And there's no sign of it stopping. And you've probably seen in the press a lot of things happening that we sort of expected, we were predicting last year, and it's just been sad to see them actually happening. Right? So that's why this is important, to start getting your head around what job vulnerabilities are, in vulnerabilities in general, and start thinking about how you manage them and how your behavior changes, right? So let's do another one. Let's give another example. Um, I have a directory. This is all good, this is not in red. I have a directory, user spool foo space bar. And I want to refer to it in URL, so there we are. And I put some URL encoding, percentage 20. Okay, fine. Um, and I can create a URL, URL from it and I can create a file from it because I can turn the URL into a file and I could print out I could print out a path and I can print out whether it exists. There we go. And I can run that. Oh, that's strange. Uh, user spool foo percentage 20 bar doesn't exist. Well, now because I forgot to decode it. It was in, in URL, your, your UUL encoding. So let's change that. So I use a different method. I create URI and then I do get path and I print them out, okay? And now I get the proper path, the, space, the percentage is 20 is gone, and of course it tr it's true, it exists. Okay, fine. So, what happens if somebody created a path on my system that had percentage 20 in it, right? So my code, if somebody had done that under the covers I had noted, my code would have said, yes, it exists, right? You may not think that's a big deal, really. The problem is, is on Windows, specifically, anybody can create top-level projects, right? So I could, I could have some code that's, the vulnerability in this case is, I'm looking for something um, that's not there, I'm looking at it incorrectly, but somebody, if they found that in the code, could create that. If they get onto your system, they could create that, okay? Okay, maybe it's not a big deal. Um, what happens if it was a bit more complicated? What happens if it was in, um, if what happens if your extensions path in your JVM had a path that didn't exist, and it was incorrectly um, typed your percentage 20? There you are, that's where part, you see space on Windows. Okay, you might, not, never, you might never notice that that was incorrectly defined in your code. So your configuration for your JVM might have that in there, but because it doesn't exist, 
It would never have got found when things were being searched. You'd never have noticed. You didn't know that there was something incorrect. Okay? And that's sort of what goes on. But then suppose somebody creates that path. Right? Now, your search algorithm is going to look in a directory that shouldn't exist, that does exist, and then can find things. So people would insert DLLs. Right? So that's how I could get your code to run my code. Right? I don't have to hack your code. I just have to look for the particular vulnerability where you're not decoding the file path pro properly. Right? Again, one line. Now, actually, that's not quite what happened, but it's a type of vulnerability that we fixed in the JVM. Right? Because we had vulnerabilities like that. So the thing I want you to start realizing is vulnerabilities are almost always simple. They're very tiny errors. Right? There are no massive explosions, no big thing. You wouldn't look at a piece of code and go, oh, that's a security vulnerability. Right? Right? It's always the joining together that makes it, makes it uh, into an exploit. Okay. So let me talk about you. You can't see. Ah, oh, OK. So you're not, visit, you're not looking at this because uh, I've just said it's little tiny bits of code. You're not thinking about it. Um, and you're probably writing this stuff and not knowing it, not knowing about it. The bad guys are out there, and they're trying to find ways in. And they're always after like middle-level execs and you know people who are afraid of other people. They've got a lot of social engineering ways of getting in, but they like targeting us, right? And again, the reason that like if you selected that, would it make it more visible? Uh, I don't know. I'm projecting it. Sorry. Don't wait. There isn't much of it. <laughs> um, right. So developers. Why are you being targeted? There is, you're, you are being social engineered. People are trying to get into your accounts, get you to do things, because you know about the code. You write the code. You normally run things on your desk in elevated um, privileges. You have root access and stuff like that. Thank you. Um, you trust. One of the most amazing things is, is the open source community, where we donate stuff to other people. And other people, like us, go, thank you very much. I'll use that. Right? I bet you that if you have any policy about the usage of open source stuff, it'll be about licenses. It won't be about providence. It won't be about what are they doing to scan their code for vulnerabilities. We don't think that way. Right? And so you can imagine if these guys can get changes in, if they can insert vulnerabilities or they can figure out by looking at open source, they can look at open source project and they find a vulnerability and they then go, well, who's using this? Fine, I'll target those, right? So in general, we do this stuff. We use code, we use tools, we don't think about it, right? So, you know, as it says at the bottom, the bad guys prey on the weak, vulnerable, and ignorant, right? And that's us. That's what it says, that's us. So if you don't think this is true, how many of you have ever done any of these sorts of things? Right? Getting Java to accept all certs over HTTPS. Yeah, I've done that. How to trust any SSL certificate. Yeah. Um, very trusting trust manager. You want to go for that one. Go to Google, go to GitHub and do a search for very trusting trust manager. You will get thousands of hits. Right? about this? Anybody written one of these? Here's a X509 Trust Manager. How many <coughs> have said, I'm just going to write my own one? And, though I should, have, should not have put it in red, is client trusted? Return true. Is server trusted? Return true. Right? I'll tell you something else. You can go Google um, GitHub for this, and you will find examples of that codified in products, in repositories. People do that. You can find that. You can find a very, very trusting trust manager, right? People do that, and then they say it's a feature. It helps you. So now we've got to add to our list. Not only are vulnerabilities bugs, but they're also features, right? right? Things that you add to make your life easier will, can easily get exploited 
by people who go, thank you very much. And I, by the end, if we get to it, and I'll show you one of those, right? So the point is, is they're everywhere, right? You don't even know you're adding them, right? And people are out there. There are people are paid to find these. There are researchers, white hat and black hat guys who are out looking for this. And when they find them, they, there is a protocol, but at some point they will get published. And then the clock starts ticking, right? And at which point uh, you become more vulnerable because now it's knowledge, now it's, now it's out there, right? Right, so let me talk about processes just to get this out the way. So I need to talk to you about how we manage um, vulnerabilities because um, it's information that you need to have in your head. Common vulnerabilities and exposures, CVEs. That's the term for the thing that tracks the vulnerability. When it's been reported um, by whoever's reporting it, there will be a CVE entry. And it's, it's international community. So uh, there's, there's a website cve.mitre.org. There's not the only one. I think there's another one. But there where you're going to go looking for vulnerabilities in a particular thing because they're registered, right? You can go and find all the Java ones, right? The thing is it allows us to talk about the same vulnerability. So you know, you can see it and go, well, there's a thing and the press is talking about it or somebody says this, that thing is fixed in my product. Whatever the problem, problem is, it's fixed. So you've got that unique tag, right? So if you go to the website, um, I updated this this morning. Um, you can search. So I said, um, oh, so the pictures aren't, like, the pictures aren't modern. The, the keyword equals Java, I did the number. So I went and said, how many CVEs are there in this system? 1662, okay? Um, if you do more specific searches, like, um, what's that thing? That's, uh, was it bean shell? Uh, yeah, so you can see you, um, one of those is XML, I think one of those is serialization. Yeah, so you can go find bugs. You can go find CVE um, um, descriptions. And if you look at them in more detail, they'll say things like this, right? Bean shell, before to, when including the class path, uses Java serialization or extreme, allows remote attackers to execute arbitrary code, right? That's just a bunch. Right, and that's the sort of wording you get. It tells you what it, you've got a number, targeted, etc. And if you looked in more detail, any one of those, that's what you're going to find. I don't know if anybody's actually done this, but you'll go find unspecified vulnerabilities, right? Because we're not going to tell you the details, right? The reason is, oh, <laughs> uh, sorry, uh, okay. <clears throat> the reason is that. Telling the world about the details of a vulnerability is the same as you tweeting your PIN number for your credit card, right? That's how stupid it is. Because as soon as you tell people, oh, like I found a vulnerability and there's no fix for it, um, you're gonna get exploited. I mean, even if there is a fix, it's still gonna get applied, but it is that bad, right? So that's why you will not find any information about that level of detail, right? And what we do do is we score them, and there's a whole bunch of processes for scoring them. Um, IBM's got them, other, other group, um, companies provide them, but at the end of the day, they all come together and we have a common scoring system, and it's based on uh, impacts and um, how, how difficult it is to, to actually um, attack and things like that. So you get... Um, these sorts of words, attack vectors, complexity, privileges required, etc. And people assess the fix, the, the vulnerability. They do it on the assumption that you know what you're doing and that you're behaving sensibly, right? So if you run all your systems under root when you shouldn't, then that's your problem, right? We're going to assume that you're being sensible at how you execute things. Anyway, that's how um, you can look at it. You can go look at these. Um, then they work out from the scores just whether it's a critical fix or not. Because at the end of the day, we've got to put resources into fixing these things. And we need to communicate with you about whether it's an important problem or, or um, not an important problem. Right. Those things can change over time. Right. The view of the assessment of a, of a, a vulnerability might change. New information may come to light, in which case it may get, it may get raised or lowered. 
And then we communicate to you. Um, Oracle do CPU advisories. IBM has similar sorts of things. You can always go find these things. Um, we're always communicating, and we communicate about what CVEs there are and what products they're fixed in, right? And, that, and, all, and some assessment about the criticality, and that's all you're going to get. Now, if you find one, we'd ask you to report it responsibly, right? Um, you can, uh, whether you can report it to Oracle, report it to IBM, those are links, and you can use the, um, access them from the um, slide deck when they're published. But there's a reasonable way of reporting them, right? Now, the thing is, if you think you found one, report it. Please don't blog about it or shout about it or um, post the details. Look, I found this code. It does this. Isn't this amazing? Please don't do that. Um, and don't worry about whether it's a you're, you, you think, oh, maybe it's not that important or not. If you think there's a vulnerability where people can execute remote code or access things that they, you know, outside privileges, then just report it, you know? And don't sell it to the bad guys. I don't know why I put that on there because you're not going to do that. And if you are, I wouldn't be able to stop you by saying that anyway, but there we go. Um, and then from the point of view of fixing this stuff, well, people, you know, we put a lot of effort into fixing fixes, in fixing um, vulnerabilities. The criticality, um, we'll do it on how, in, how critical it is. We'll also do it on the fact that maybe somebody out there is threatened that they're going to report it unless it gets fixed. You have some people who are like that. Um, but otherwise, we'll be trying to do the best. And occasionally, you'll get um, an out-of-band um, update with security fixes. That means something big is in there, right? Otherwise, it just goes into the next re regular, re regular release, OK? Now, the weird thing is here is that we give you these scores for you to go check whether it means anything to you. And we tell you what component is in. And in theory, I can make statements like this, which says, if it's not relevant to you, you won't have to apply it. I don't use JAXP, for instance, so I don't need to put the fixes in because they're only for JAXP. Right? The trouble I have is, I'm not going to show another red screen. OK. This is ridiculous. Right? If you don't know what your code does, you don't know if you're vulnerable. Right? So if you don't know what your dependencies are, you don't know if you're vulnerable. The thing is, we don't know what our dependencies are. You may know what your top level dependencies are. You're building Maven or whatever, and you go, yeah, well, A, Y, A, A, B, C. But they have dependencies too, and they have dependencies. And people don't check, right? So one of the things you have to start doing is getting into the habit of going, what are my dependencies? And there are tools out there to help you. There are tools out there to assess. You can go find out whether a particular version of a Maven module has vulnerabilities, right? That might be complicated to get it fixed, but at least you'd be assessing it. We don't do that. We, as a, as a group, we tend to just insert and put the next one in and just do it. So we don't know what our vulnerabilities are. OK, so that's the processes. Uh, let's talk a little bit about how these things get in. The attack vectors are, how do, the, how do people get the vulnerabilities into you? How do they get? Um, so untrusted code, that's the usual way. Um, well, it's one of two. This is finding places where you've got code that does bad things, and I can call them. Um, you'd be surprised. You might have some code on the class path that you didn't know you had, but has a vulnerability in. And then I find a way of actually calling that code. And that code might do something bad, like runtime.exec or something. Um, I might be able to you know, run code that um, get you to run my code, or I might find code that you've already got, as I said, and, and run that. Right? I don't necessarily have to deliver you code. I may just need to figure a way of making your application run the code that you've already got. Um, and as, as, as we said right at the beginning, some of this isn't about anything other than denial of service. And there's, you know, you can't, there's, security managers don't stop you spinning your CPU. There's the plugin in the web start, which of course has been the biggest thing as far as the world is concerned about, you know, reducing Java's reputation as a secure environment. Uh, let's, we know, that's going. So let's not talk about that. Untrusted data, that's probably 
the biggest one that we all fall foul of, which is where you're taking, you're taking data in and you're parsing it, okay, and it's got some bad effects. And I'll show you an example in a sec. Right? There's lots of parsers that we use. Right? And we think of parsers mostly as text, but actually there are images, um, there are fonts, there are other things. And untrusted data has, you're reading data without validating it, and it has a side effect. Okay? And so, for instance, if you're uploading images, if you've got a server that uploads images, uh, I had one, I tried to do one a few weeks ago. Server wanted me to upload an image of myself, and it said no more than one meg, and I had an image that was significantly bigger. I uploaded it, and it didn't say, hey, that's, that's um, too big, it just took it, right? So uh, nothing bad happened, but that would be a vulnerability if my uploading an image bigger than what it said crashed the system, okay? But it's even more exciting with images. Uh, there was this JPEG 2000 exploit in some code which let you upload not just pictures of kittens, but you could take, <coughs> there's parsing going on. Your image comes up in a form and it gets converted into memory. And as part of that processing, your code does things. And somebody had figured out there was a buffer overflow in that code, and that by having the right image, they could get your code to run arbitrary code. Right? So you'd never be able to see it on the image, but it was tucked away there. Okay. Uh, how about this one? So this is this I've given the URL because this is very well documented, and you and, and you will get this who this is in a second. The top box says content type. So this is a content type header that's being pushed to a server. Okay, you do a get and you put the content type. And there's some stuff. And this is OGNL, which is a scripting language. Um, and the back end is Apache Struts. So Apache Struts um, gets, the, gets the payload and it says, does the content type contain multi-part form data? It doesn't care if it's well formed, it's just, can I find those words? Yes. Then it tries to parse it. And it tries to parse it, um, and it goes, that's not forms data. So it for, it's going to throw an exception. Part of the exception process is to build a nice message that goes back. And part of that ended up calling OGNL. And OGNL understood what that was, and it executed it. And you can see there's an exec curl local, right? So do you know who this is? Equifax, right? right. So that thing that you've been hearing about, right, was that, right? It was, it was just a vulnerability. But because anybody could do it, because all you gotta do is post some data, you know, everybody's vulnerable. I can post it. If you have that vulnerability, um, anybody can get your system to do anything because they've got access to runtime exec. Right? So uh, the other one is cryptogra cryptographic issues. Um, protocol flaws, we've probably heard about those where if somebody figures out that, that the, the encryption isn't as strong as they would expecting and they find um, holes in it. And, and for some reason, these things all get lovely names, whereas if there's a problem with the implementation, it's just a bug, right? And they have different impacts, right? And you'll be able to go find these. You go to the CVE website, you would be able to find these, and, um, and uh, you wouldn't be able to get the details, but you'd be able to get some sense of the impact. Right? And then there's local. Things that can only be done by people who have access to your system, like you, right? Now, there are um, little things like you create files. Your application creates a file, um, and it's got inappropriate permissions. It's too open or whatever. And you go, so what? Nobody can access my system, OK? Um, or you might have, like I showed you at the beginning with the paths, you might have something in your path that doesn't exist. Somebody could insert code at that location. Right. Now these things usually have low scores 
because they're assuming that you're securing your system that they can't actually get on to your system. And you might think, it says there, you don't think you're vulnerable to local attacks. What about this one? Anybody get that? No. Does anybody know anybody who got that? Yes. Right. So this is this wonderful WannaCry thing. Right. That was local access, remote local access to your system. Right. This is really bad. Right. So this came out in May. Um, when I wrote this then, it was still climbing um, 250,000 computers. It encrypts the data on your disk and holds it to ransom. It holds you to ransom. And then you pay the, com the computer owner in Bitcoin, which is untraceable because you can't, you don't know, it's all anonymous ownership. Um, you can't see the box there, but I'll, it reads. So in the UK, um, we had National Health, National Health Service, the hospitals cancelled operations because they were hit by it. In India, all the ATMs closed. Um, Nissan had to stop all its production. Renault halted its production, right? Partly because they had these really old systems, but you know, WannaCry got in there, all right? The really ironic thing is, is that it turned out that the guys who did this then blogged about the fact that it wasn't much of a success for them. They didn't get anywhere near as much money as they expected, right? And so they're gonna have another go. I want you to realize that getting access to your server even if you think it's in a data center, it's, also good. it's, not, um, it's not impossible. And if they can get access to your desktop machine and your desktop as a developer, you might have better access to these things, they get in, right? So more examples of vulnerabilities. Serialization. How many people use serialization? Yeah, everybody uses serialization. Um, there's a th concept called gadget chains, right? So what happens here is people figure out what code you've got and then they start constructing specific serialization forms. So if you don't pass your serialization data when it comes in, and I've seen examples of people who use serialization, serialized form of Java and they store it in a cookie on the browser. So they just, it comes back and they just deserialize it, which is just the wrong thing to do. But you can imagine that if you've got serialized for, if people can construct serialized forms of data, right? And there are places in the serialization process where that's just easy. You just read an object. Well, okay, what's in the data? That tells you what an object it is. There's something, you don't have any control over it. The serialization process is reading what the string, what the form says, right? And you have lots of instances of people crafting serialized, serialized data, um, pay, payloads, right? Um, so there's some serialization filtering coming in to make that better, to make it uh, allow you to, be, to whitelist things you're going to accept, right, rather than completely random code. Um, but we've known about it for years, um, and then there was the Apache Commons uh, exploit that brought it to the fore. Right, and then you go fix it. But as I said, the thing about this one is, is that so many people use, that don't do anything with their serialized data. You, you send it to a server, you receive it, and you don't think about the fact that you could be getting um, totally bogus serialized form. Right? Or you can be doing things like this, which is even more bogus. Um, JDWP, Java Debug Wire Protocol, the thing you use when you want to connect your debugger, um, it's turned on. It's turned off, I mean. Uh, a certain large bank, not only did they turn it on, they made it available uh, externally. The thing about JDWP is, is there's no security. So if you can access the debug port, you can do whatever you want. So you can imagine somebody found this researcher found it, just did a simple port scan, found the DWP port. No, it can't be this simple. Fire up a debugger? Yeah, into the bank. I've got the contents, and in fact, more than that, I can, I've got a debugger, right? People do that. Right, some more code, because I'm sure you want to see some more code. Um, this, is, this is a, this example is about uh, how we 
uh, can be our own worst enemies in other ways. So lots of code here, but basically it's a properties object, helpful class loader, um, and there's a load class helpfully method. And what happens is you get given a string, and you do class.forName, and if it doesn't find it, it says, um, I couldn't find it, and here's the name of the thing you asked me for. And it's got a little tiny properties thing. So what happens is I say uh, load class for, I've got a handle and I've got a real class name. So I go load class um, what, foo. And I go to the map and I go, what's, what's the key? What the key is foo, what's the value? Try and find it, doesn't work. So I come back and I say, um, couldn't find it, right? So I've got, I return, um, if I run that, I return something like this. So class for default equals class foo.string handler. Okay. So that's the output message. And then, where am I going to go? Um, bear with me, I'm losing the tracker. Uh, so now if I ask for class foo, so the default works, if I ask for class foo, um, it says, it says, could not create class for handler foo with value com IBM runtimes dot demo dot foo. Okay, so I couldn't find it. Good. Um, where are we going next with this? Okay, so what happens if, you see it says load class, I should go back because I didn't point that out to you. Let me get back a section. You can see um, it's under the try, it's got load class helpfully with the name of the, the key. So I did default and then I did foo. What happens if I put something in that's got no expectation of being in my properties file? java.ext.ders. Okay, what do I get back? Well, I get an exception, and I get could not create class for handler java.home. Okay, that didn't work well. Um, with value, here's the value of my java.home. Where did that come from? That wasn't in my properties file. Well, my properties file was backed by system.getProperties. Okay, so what happens when you do a get on properties, when in that case, it says, can't find it in your, your instance. I'll go back to the backing properties, which case was system.properties, right? So now I can ask for anything that's in your system.properties, right? Imagine if this class was about, um, You've got, a, you've got a key and you've got a value. So the value is a class name. The key I, could be a handler name. It could be anything. So imagine you've got something like XML, which has a bunch of values, and it says, use this handler. Right? And then the code takes that handler and goes to your, this lovely little code and says, what's the class name for this handler to do the parsing? OK, fine. And then somebody puts in that XML um, something like java.home, and it doesn't work. It fails. but the error message gets percolated back. So the, the guy attacking your system, because you were helpful in telling them what, the prob what they tried to use and what the value was, because you've done that piece, because you've fed back good information, they now have full access. So they can sit there and wander through your system. Right? So something like that, that sort of yeah, coupled with the, um, the URL decoder, this is what creates fun exploits. Right. I had a helpful, a helpful piece of code. I have a remote execution code tool. Okay. I put them together, and, I, and I'm compromised because I've got, I've got a WannaCry type thing to deliver some remote execution code, and I've got ways of coming in and finding information from your system. Um, and between the two of those, I can completely exploit your system. Right. So we've got to add to a vulnerability is a bug and a feature, it's also a developer aid. If you are helpful, every time you are helpful to yourself, right? every time you're helpful to yourself, you run the risk of being helpful for, for these attackers. It's the little things that wire together that do that. So when you're thinking about this, um, when you're thinking about being helpful, think about the downsides of the information you're sharing. 
right? Because it's little things like that that let people in. So I have about 10 minutes left. So let's just go through the summary here, which unfortunately is in red and white. So what can you do, right? So I've said things to you like, all the code, every code has vulnerabilities. When we discover them, we don't tell you any details. Uh, you've seen that they could be little tiny bits of code. There's nothing big smoking gun here. So there are a couple of things. Um, the very first one, obviously, is keep current. Every fix that you can find, you should be applying. And I say that, and people go, no, but that means it'll disable my system. So the challenge you've got to have is, do you want a safe system or a stable system? I actually want both, right? So the good news is, that things like microservices, where we start to compartmentalize our applications, is making it easier. Our deployment models, where we're trying starting to deploy and scale services and version services, they help too. Because you can actually, you're actually in a mode already of testing things. So you can actually deploy faster and test, right? And reduce the risk, right? But it's that separation, those bulkheads of a, of a ship that we need to create, right? You've got to get to the point where a single compromise isn't going to bring your system down, right? You have to look at your levels of helpfulness um, and flexibility. The number of times you've probably sat there and said, well, yeah, this will work. And if I just made this change, it'll do something extra. It'll be more useful, more flexible. And every time you do that, you run the risk of somebody exploiting that flexibility. Right. So that's what you've got to start thinking about. When you're designing your Java, you're designing your APIs, are you validating your data? Are you looking at the flexibility? You know, this, if, if this guy passes in star, I can do anything. You know, it's those sorts of what's the value to you versus the value, the, the value for the attacker. I would encourage you all to go read about penetration testing. Even if you are not somebody who says they work um, on, you know, close to the front door, if you go learn about penetration testing, you will see what the guys are doing to get into your system, right? There are professional penetration testers, and they do the social engineering. They will phone you up and convince you that they're, that they're your mother, and that will give you your passcodes. You know, they're very good at getting information out, out from you, and they're very good at getting into your system, right? Uh, there was a talk earlier this week about secure coding guidelines. Um, it's a bit of a dry document, but that is also something really, really worth working, looking at. That tells you, from a Java point of view, what, what is good and what is bad. Right, good, good, um, good guidelines there. My last line is all about um, understanding the risk. And it really is about you understanding your role in this, in this. As a developer, you are no longer free just to write the code that you want. You've got to think all the time about what are you doing to make it, making your system more open, right? And is that what you need to do? And that's the biggest thing here. So I think I've said most of this already. Um, there are some other things we'd ask you not to do. Um, so keeping all up to, up to date, absolutely. Use vulnerability scanning tools. There are lots of vulnerability scanning tools. If you want to find out whether your Maven's got Maven, um, uh, downloads have got vulnerabilities, there are tools for that. If you want to know whether your Docker image has got vulnerabilities, there are tools for that. There are lots of tools out there to let you understand your position, and you should be looking around those. Um, there are certain things we'd ask you not to do, generally. Don't write custom security managers. No trusting, 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 please. Um, don't write your own crypto code. Don't think that hashing is encryption. Um, don't write XML, custom XML parsers. Basically, uh, the trade-off is between you doing it yourself and getting it right versus getting it wrong. Whereas if you, lay, if you rely on other people, yes, your possibility of getting um, um, some vulnerabilities, but you've got a lot more people investing their time and effort in making sure those things are correct. And keep your, whatever encryption protocols you, you're using, as soon as the next one comes out, you have to move to it. Right? It's like TLS. Right. The vulnerabilities were found in those protocols. 
So that's why you know we you, you've seen all these things like browsers and that moving up the level of TLS that they support because the old ones are bogus and broken. So you're just fooling yourself if you continue to use them. Yeah, uh, and then generally be very uncomfortable, very careful with untrusted code. Think about deserialization. I would uh, I say have a good look at why you're using uh, serialization and whether you should use something else or other forms of serialization. Uh, and uh, you know JDP etc and etc. So um, there are bad guys out there, and they're out to get you. Right? And it's your job to prevent that happening by being more informed, starting to change the way that you behave, right, and just generally not ignoring it. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs>